Wonderful. Yeah, so really excited. Oh, we good to um, be speaking today and joining today um, with Jade. Um, Natural Curiosity is a partner of the um, Outdoor Learning Store. And so um, I'm gonna pass it on to Jade to get us started and then um, on this conversation um, and then Natural Curiosity will jump in. But, you know, as sort of thinking that maybe many of you on this conversation know the story of Natural Curiosity. So, um, I will be sharing more a little bit about it as well, but also wanted to welcome um, Jade's voice to the story to also bring um, more of a national perspective to the conversation too, because she's coming from um, a different location than we are. And um, it's always great to, to partner and think about this um, nationally, but also know that we also have to think about it from from where we're coming from um, and why that's important too. So take it away, Jade. Thanks so much, Hayley. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, and indeed, I work with the Outdoor Learning Store. We're a charitable nonprofit um, that shares outdoor uh, educational uh, resources, equipment and tools. Uh, and a big part of that is um, central to all of that whenever we are uh, onto an island or learning with the land is that um, Indigenous perspectives should be at the absolute heart and so uh, this is a huge topic and I realise we have an hour or less now um, and so I'm hoping and Hayley's the same that we, we can share our emails and, and whilst we would love to go dive deeper and have this amazing space for discussion and things um, I'm hoping we might have a second at the end for any questions but if you do have any questions maybe you could type them in the chat um, and maybe we could get to them later or um, let's let's continue this conversation for me this is just the starting point for us to go forward um, so next slide, please. So my name's Jade Harvey Burrell. I am an environmental educator. I'm originally from the UK. I moved to Canada in 2015. And I spend most of my time uh, teaching, incredibly fortunate to teach in environments that look like this. This is the Arrow Lakes Reservoir. It's, a, um, it's an artificial reservoir created by the damming of the Columbia River. And um, this river is incredibly important. Next slide, please. Um, for my personal land enlargement, my understanding. So I am a British person. Um, I'm just about to take my Canadian citizenship um, test, which, by the way, focus very heavily on Queen and government and not so much on Indigenous perspectives. Um, having read the details of that, it's kind of upsetting. Um, but the re only reason I'm sitting here is because there is this commonwealth of which really the only commonality is that the wealth went to the colonizers and um, we stripped the wealth of the places that we went to and have dominated. Um, you know, I didn't learn about indigenous perspectives in my upbringing. We learned about world wars. We learned about the Romans. And I first, I traveled through Australia and New Zealand and I, I met Aboriginal people and Maori people and started to hear this story of, oh, when the British came and the French and the Dutch, and this is what happened. Um, and what happened was complete decimation of culture. Well, firstly, to utilize the skills and the knowledge of the indigenous people who generally it appears from the historical records and the diaries, particularly where I am, were, the indigenous people aided the settlers in traveling up the Columbia River, for example, up into the mountains from the coast. They helped them to obtain um, travel, food, uh, safety resources. They guided them. And then we made them sick. And we decimated their culture. And we stole their children. Um, sorry, this was hard and we told them that they were worth nothing and in fact particularly so I live in Revelstoke you can see it's just down here this is a map from the autonomous tonight um and they call this river this is the Columbia River the blood of life and that's why on this map it's red rather than blue as we have on colonial maps and for the tonight first nations people who lived up and down this river um this north to south uh portion of the Columbia River. Uh, this is the Sinaixt people, it means bull trout in the Imselsheen language. 
And uh, where I live is called Skihikan, and it means where the ridge lines meet the water. And we have Selkirks to the east, Monashi Mountains to the west, two huge ridge lines dropping down to the water. And the Sinaiaxt were declared extinct by the Canadian government in 1965, um, in conjunction with the fact that they were planning to dam on what is now the second most heavily dammed river in the world, uh, this section in order to uh, create hydroelectric power. And we flooded all of their traditional fishing settlements that they would move up and down through seasonally. Uh, we destroyed the fish populations that had sustained not only this Tanayaks here, um, but this place is, is also known, loved and stewarded over different times by the Shequetmet people, the Shushwap Lakes people who are just west of the Monashies here. Um, the Okanagan Silks people who are southwest who traveled here to exchange um, grassland knowledge and technology and, and to fish. And the Tanaha. Um, I'm actually not in Revelstoke today. I'm in I'm in Invermere, which is homelands of the Tanaha and the Shaquetmet people. And um, they call this river and where I live in Revelstoke, um, Tumitek Mishkakas, which means the land of the chickadees. And I see them every day and I'm here uh, on their homelands and I'm an uninvited guest. And the people that are from the country that I was born in came here and built schools schools and killed a bunch of indigenous children through that schooling system and the truth of that is that I'm just diving into that knowledge now so I have felt particularly uncomfortable as an environmental educator over the last few years honestly um to teach anything because I'm because of my accent like I was so horrified by that firstly but a lot of us share that ancestry in some way shape or form um so the guilt part has been huge for me and I've had to push past that and my indigenous mentors have told me that that is a barrier to change and to reconciliation but I acknowledge the truth of what has happened um I'm devastated by it um and I also have this huge conflict because that the fact that they came here means that I had easy access initially to a visa and then to permanent residency and then to become a citizen of this country so my uh, reconciliation journey is a long one next slide please I just want to share even how complex it can be in one place. So this is a map that was created by a local museum um, that talks about shared land. These are the four groups, the Shaquetnik, the Silks, um, the Sinaiaks and the Snaha. But for the Sinaiaks who were declared extinct, they were the only people declared extinct and pushed down south of the border onto what's known now known as the Colville Confederated Tribes. Twelve different tribes put together on one reservation. Um, the word shared is incredibly triggering and so like as I've been through this journey and I was uh, learn later about hosting events and things and trying to talk to the First Nations you know to have your to be not just to be told that you your culture is wrong and denied it and that you shouldn't speak your language and you absolutely shouldn't practice your cultural traditions but then to be told that you cease to exist like I can't comprehend that. And so my Sinaiaxed friends are fiercely protective over this space in the center here and in that it's not shared because if it was shared, then surely everybody would be extinct. Nobody would be there. And so there is intractable conflict existing where I live. And I have been in conversations that have been deeply uncomfortable related to this. I have sat and listened to a Sinaiaxed elder say to a Sinaiaxed elder, so where were you when we were in court trying to fight for our survival? Where were you? So it's it's difficult stuff. Um, and these conversations are huge. And I have no right to be in there other than the fact that I am passionate about speaking about this place that we live in and sharing that with the next generation. And so this is an ongoing and very complex learning journey. Next slide, please. Just wanted to share a brief picture. This is Shelley Boyle. She is the Arrow Lakes uh, facilitator for the Conf Colville Confederated Tribes of the Snakes. And this is her. Uh, I had invited her to speak uh, to open a conference that I'd um, hosted in as part of Classrooms to Communities BC Network for educators. And I'd asked Shelley to open. And what she did is she opened and she brought along these three beautiful young women with her. And this is their mum, Dana to speak the Sinaiaxt language for the first time, the Inselshi language by Sinaiaxt people in this land uh, for the first time we think in a couple of hundred years. And so they came up and this is a book uh, by a white um, 
uh, uh, author called Eileen Dillahanty Perks, but she's a great friend and ally of the Snipes. But this book is called The Heart of the River, and it's the story of the Columbia River from the river's perspective. And these kids came and they are learning their language, their cultural language that was banned, that was denied. And it, we sat there and this reading took about 35 minutes. And these kids were stilted, like kids learning to read. Um, it was a bit stilted. It was awkward. There were moments of, of like tension. You could feel it in people's bodies sitting in this space. And Shelley's come out at this point because there was a moment of pause and these young girls standing there in front of 350 people. And she comes out and she says, I just want you to stop for a second. Thank you, girls. And she looks into the audience. She said, this is what real reconciliation looks like. Sitting with the discomfort of people struggling to speak their language sitting with this discomfort of of young people struggling in pain because that intergenerational trauma but also the resilience that's being shown here to say no I will learn it even though I didn't have it from birth because my parents or my grandparents were too scared to speak it or they lost their language because they were beaten for speaking it we are revitalizing these languages we are reclaiming our heritage and so for me that was the most beautiful moment it was in a dry eye in the house where we sat there for a moment in deep discomfort but knowing that something very special had happened in that place to hear that language brief life to the story not only of those girls but of the river of this place of this space and we were moments away from the columbia river as this was being told and so this work is messy, it's uncomfortable, I've cried, I've lost sleep, uh, but I'm here and I keep trying. Um, and I hope that you will too in the work that you're doing and I'm sure that you are. The next slide, please. Okay, um, for time's sake, I'm not going to um, play this video. Um, but this was the Shaquette McHonor song for the children and, and we are continuing to still find graves, mass graves. Um, but I would urge you and I can give you the link in the chat. Um, and this is for my people. This is recorded. It's an honor song for the lost children and it is, there's permission to sing it, to drum it. This one is subtitled so that you can see the words and it's drummed by two drummers. Um, that if even in just this moment or another moment, you take a second um, to honor the children that have been lost. For me, um, that's something that I do frequently and this is a beautiful resource that we have and I can share the, the link to you later, but I'm gonna pass it over to Hayley and, and the next slide to move forward. Thank you. Yeah, and Alexa, if you could just refresh that for a sec. Thank you so much, Jade, um, for that um, powerful, I almost want to say land acknowledgement, right? Well, it is. And it's so much more meaningful than a scripted land acknowledgement that, that you know, is, is a, a place to start as many of us are, are realizing and understanding that land acknowledgements, scripted land acknowledgements are a place to start, but then our responsibility, um, at least where I'm coming from as a treaty person, um, is to continue to learn what that actually means. Um, and that done through storytelling that done through explaining relationships that's done through um relationship to land and and so um so much of what you've shared already is a beautiful um and meaningful example of that so thanks so much um many of you if you've attended a natural curiosity workshop in the past you've seen this land acknowledgement that was developed by grade six students at at the lab school um and you know I, i'm sharing it because it was developed by students but i'm also sharing it because it um, is meant to be a living document that changes as we learn more. As Jade's already explained, um, there is so much complexity um, in, in the learning and in the unlearning for many or all of us, I, I would say, um, on this land. Um, so, for example, one thing that, that has been identified that is missing from this land acknowledgement um, that is given uh, or shared at the lab school 
So um, natural curiosity is, uh, I'm kind of jumping all over the place, but um, uh, an organization that is based out of the Dr. Jackman Institute of Child Study. Um, and there is a school that has children from nursery to grade six. And so this is the land acknowledgement that, that they have worked on. But one of the things that is missing um, and through relationships, uh, continued relationships with um, Indigenous educators, especially Doug Anderson, who um, helped to write the Indigenous lenses on the second edition of Natural Curiosity. Um, he's shared that there's no mention here of uh, the dish with one spoon wampum and our responsibility to... Um, to the area uh, that that we're on, and and part of that responsibility is um, uh, being responsible to the dish with one spoon uh, wampum belt covenant, and so that's something that I believe has now been added to to this land acknowledgement, um, and you know it's meant to, like I said, continue to change, and you know something that we, that is a part of this conversation that Jade has already mentioned and I think that we're all thinking about is how do we think critically about land acknowledgements and how do we move past them? So Alexa, you can share the next slide. Um, Natural Curiosity put out a, a post um, probably about half a year ago, bringing forward leading indigenous voices um, around land acknowledgements. And so one of them um, is Hayden King, who, you know, he talks about how scripted land acknowledgements allow settlers to evade the real work of reflecting on and committing to their ethical and political obligations on this land. Um, and so, yeah, how do we, how do we think about, about moving past this? And he, he likes to, he says, it's one to, thing to say, thing to say, hey, we're on the territory of the sagas or the Anishinaabe, which is a territory that, that I um, am coming from, coming from Toronto, but it's another thing to say we're on the territory of uh, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee, and here's what that compels me to do. So I really think that's part of this conversation today, right? What, what is this compelling you to do? And then also, how does this compel you to get past the fear, which I think so many of us um, and again, I don't know who's on this conversation, but myself as a settler doing this work, um, and from what I've heard from so many other educators and, and settlers um, on this land is this fear of, of making mistakes, this fear of appropriating. Um, how do we, how do we get, get past that? Um, and do this really important work that we are responsible for. We're responsible to truth and reconciliation. So first, as Jade has already mentioned, that's learning the truth, right? And we need to do that work. Um, and if we're doing that work in a meaningful way, then we are definitely going to be less likely to, to appropriate, but also acknowledge that, that we might make some mistakes along the, along the way. And, and there, there's so much humility that has to happen as well with this with this learning. Um, so going to the next slide, just wanted to share this because this is a connecting to this land acknowledgement idea as well, is that the second edition of Natural Curiosity was also launched on land. So we're, we're coming from Toronto, which is a very big city, um, but Doug Anderson, who's the author of um, the Indigenous Lenses, as I mentioned, um, he um, works a lot along the Humber River in Toronto um, and has supported us in, in also forming a relationship to, to this area, to this land. And so even before we launched the second edition of Natural Curiosity in an institution, which is the lab school and the Institute of Child Study, um, we made sure in a teaching, um, a teaching lodge along the Humber River to, to feast the book to light the fire, to talk about our hopes and our dreams sitting on the land about what this resource can mean and how it can support both Indigenous and non-Indigenous educators um, with understanding the importance of incorporating Indigenous perspectives in environmental and all education. So I think I'm passing it back over to you, Jane. 
um I love what you said there and um mistakes I make them all the time um but the more I build relationships the more there is this honesty for them whoever I'm speaking to if I've said something wrong or if I've I've you know come at things from a, a really colonial perspective for them to say actually you know it makes me feel like this when you do that and I think this is one of the problems with this work is you're like you know why isn't there an indigenous person speaking here and there are some recordings that I have um I record a podcast with the outdoor learning store called earthy chats it's free there's several uh, recordings there with different indigenous creators who um that have each said to me in their own way like it's really nice that you want us to come and drum or sing or tell our stories, but A, half of our elders are sick or dying. We're just learning how to revitalize our culture. A bunch of people don't have the knowledge that you think we do uh, and are ashamed of that. And or this is your work. This is your job. You, you, reconciliation is your work. We're just trying to survive. And actually then when you, and that is not to put, um, a, a culture of of um you know victimization on in a pan-indigenous lens um just because they've suffered it also means they have incredible resilience but there's there's a lot of things going on in my four communities that i know intimately where they are just trying to make it work uh, and trying to support their own children and their own cultural legacy and so this is our work and you know what it might look like this so one of my um beautiful mentors is a is a Shikretma. she's her mother Shikretma and her father is Taha um yeah, indigenous educator um she's actually the vice principal for indigenous education um of SD6 in um British Columbia uh and her own perspective of what going beyond land acknowledgements looks like, what real reconciliation looks like, is this. Take your students outside. And it doesn't have to be, we're not even, we, and I really approve and have been encouraged to read Indigenous stories that have been published and that you give proper provenance to, but just go outside because Indigenous perspectives from her mouth to my ears were that it is about relationship and reciprocity. So when you go out there, when you teach them to value the bugs that are crawling amongst the grass or the relationship between eagle and mouse, those are indigenous perspectives. It's reawakening the part of ourselves that is really deeply connected and sees ourselves as a part of nature and not separate from it, not on top of. Um, you could go move to the next slide, please. It could be taking older students out and visiting places like this. This is Mount Begbie. It's named for the so-called hanging judge. The indigenous people here, the Sinaiics, I will put a link to um, a short documentary about this. They lost the name for this mountain. And so when this trip is about hiking, it's about 18 kilometers of hiking with teenagers to get to this point. It's about camping. It's about leave no trace principles. It's also about the story of that mountain lost in its indigenous tongue because of colonization. And so these conversations with students, this reality is um, a conversation I'm having even with really young students about the fact that, oh, there was a language here before our one and, and they weren't allowed to speak it, but, and I'll share with you later, we're gonna learn the names for this place. I'm gonna say hello to you today. I'm gonna say hello, good morning, everyone. I would say white, yayaswe, hi everyone, if I was in, uh, the Sinaiq's homelands where I live. Language is key. And when we when we speak languages, we, we take relationship away from the fact that the most indigenous cultures of, of Turtle Island, rock has spirit, um, lake has spirit, water has spirit, it has self, it's a person. It's not human, but it's a person. And so those relationships are important. And next slide, please. It can also look like this. This is really hard, deep, dark work, but it can also be lighthearted and joyful. I hear um, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I dress differently for each season, but this is my class. We do sort of nature through the seasons and what we do is build relationship. This is our tree, our birch tree um, behind them here. 
and we build relationship over the year. So we we ask, um, how do we think she's feeling in this moment? We sit beneath her and look at her canopy and see how it changes over time. We look for evidence of life in the understory and in relation between the lichen growing around her bar. Um, and we measure her and care for her, which is the sort of colonial aspect, but also we talk to her, which connects into the indigenous perspectives. And there are so many books uh, books like Celia and the Land and other Indigenous texts that really, and within Natural Curiosity, you see them as well, that is really about this relationship building. And so while I would say this work can be really hard, um, the perspective I got from Jenna and from several other mentors is that this is reconciliation as well, relationship building with place. Um, next slide, please. But Hayley mentioned a bit about sort of what does the land acknowledgement mean for me? Or what am I going to do to do work? Um, this is me. I look ridiculous. Um, I'm wearing an Every Child Matters flag as a cape. Uh, I you know, was really pleased in that day that my bike was orange because it felt really good. Um, but this is Sasha Eugene up front here. This is a beautiful young um, Shaquetmuk woman who was doing a medicine walk. And, and for her tradition, that is, they went to the uh, residential school where her grandmother um, was taken to um, throughout all of her childhood. Uh, and she went and collected the spirits of the dead children and walked them home. She walked them home 450 kilometers walking along the highway one, the main arterial highway of, of, of where we live in BC. And I met her uh, for a bit. And actually these two ladies in the middle were, um, Blackfoot Cree um, women who were doing a medicine walk in the opposite direction and we ended up ended up bumping into each other on the highway and um, I was introduced to Sasha through um, a person I work with and um, connected with her on Facebook about the fact that she was going to be there and I walked for 10k with her and then I cycled back down highway one which was the worst biking decision of my life um, horrible horrible I'm wearing sandals I did not think it through um but I walked with her and I would love to tell you the full story but we don't have time but long story short later that night her and her grandmother were camping her stove broke I brought her a stove I ended up being very fortunate enough to spend several hours within an indigenous led um medicine circle of which I was privy to about 12 or 13 different indigenous people speaking um about their own personal uh, grief experiences with residential schools whether it was experienced themselves or intergenerationally and deeply traumatic deeply traumatic and i think many of us have experienced trauma in our lives in some way um but you know, twice as likely to, to have drug and alcohol addiction, twice as likely to have children taken into care. The system is racist and, and, and discriminatory against people still, um, even if not as overtly. And so listening to the story of this young woman and her grandmother made me realise that I have to, I have to do this work, even though I can tell you from the bottom of my heart how deeply uncomfortable it makes me to come here and tell you that I know anything because, because of my upbringing, because of where I live, because, but I'm working really hard to build relationships. I ask questions. I ask them, what can I do to be an ally? And actually in that circle, and I'm a chatty, chatty person. And in that circle, I sat silently as they passed their healing pipe, as they underwent their ceremony, which I was invited into. I resisted. I was told that I needed to come in and that's okay. And I did. But I sat silently for probably the first time in my life and the elder, um, Helen, who was taking, leading that ceremony, she said to me, or you with the big mouth. And I was like, oh, did I say something? But I am. She said, you, you have a platform. I see it. And you aren't afraid to speak up. She said, this is your job. This was two years ago. She said, this is your job is to open your mouth and to support us. Everywhere you go, tell them, tell them that we are important, tell them that we have something to say and share that we need help, that we need support to do the work that means that our children are proud to be who they are. And um, 
because a lot of the indigenous women I know who are my mentors, if you could get away with it, if you were light skinned enough, you didn't talk about, you didn't say that you were indigenous if you were living off reservation because you were so discriminated against. You would just, you would rather not. So there's so many different concepts going on here. But this walk, um, this was my first real experience where I sat and had a conversation with someone and said, I don't know anything other than the books I'm reading. I've dedicated myself to reading like indigenous written books and trying to learn what's going on. And she said, it's just hard. It's hard to be proud. It's hard to live life in a country where you feel like a second class citizen, even though you're, you, you, the rocks and the very sky and the plants speak to you from your heart face and people are telling you that it's not yours and that you don't belong here. And so this work is work of the heart and it's really uncomfortable. Again, um, and I'm a scientist by trade. Um, I've had to unlearn so much and I'm still on that journey. But I'll ask you to skip the next slide. I would show you a video of us walking on the highway. Um, but, you know, for time's sake, we'll keep skipping and I'll pass it back to you, Hayley. Thank you. Yeah, so I think so much of this is as we've sort of talked about and Jade just mentioned again, is acknowledging there is so much that we don't know. And in education, teachers and edu even informal educators, naturalists, like we are expected to be experts. And so part of this work is actually challenging this notion um, and saying, you know what, we are not experts and there is still so much to learn. And part of Natural Curiosity's journey in creating the second edition is having people challenge that and say, okay, your first resource is a, was a great start, right? It was encouraging, as Jade said, uh, educators to take their students outside to form a relationship with the land and there were already Indigenous perspectives included in that without us sort of acknowledging that um, or even really knowing that and so um, it was you know in the early days of, of um, thinking about creating a second edition that that we were pushed to by educators um, from Arrowland First Nation, as well as Seven Generations Education Institute and Rainy River District School Board, we had relationships with, with educators, um, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous educators, who said, you know, this is an incredible start, but you could be doing so much better uh, of a job to be incorporating Indigenous perspectives and like Jade said, share with the educational world that Indigenous perspectives are an integral part of this work. You have the platform to do that, so do it. Um, and, you know, we, we listened and we, uh, a great thing about coming from an educational institution that values and, and really teaches through an inquiry approach is this idea that we're always constantly learning. And actually this quote is further on in the slideshow, but I'm gonna say it in case we don't get there. There's an incredible webinar or um, podcast actually from the Peel District School Board, which is a school board um, in my area. Um, and they had, um, they had Nick Bertrand on who, um, works for the Ministry of Education um, within Indigenous education. And he says that um, one of the most decolonized ped pedagogies that we have in our toolbox today is actually inquiry. And so, you know, hearing that, teaching through an inquiry approach um, and, and thinking about how that can support decolonizing education, I think is so important, but it also allowed us um, to say, yeah, no, they, we don't know this and we are willing to think about this and learn more and, um, you know, support truth and reconciliation through the creation of a second edition of, of, um, of the resource. 
And part of that was, um, you know, forming relationships with educators. So the next slide, Alexa, is um, in the back of the book, there are stories from educators from across Ontario. One story is um, from Marge and Sarah and Glenda and Gail, who are from a school that services mostly Indigenous children um, outside of Fort Francis, Ontario. And they, if you've read Natural Curiosity in the back, they have uh, a story about an inquiry of a white rabbit. The, it hadn't snowed yet and the kids saw what they thought was a plastic bag, but it was actually a white rabbit. And so it led into this whole inquiry of how that rabbit was white and why was it white before the snow and, um, you know, lots of learning that, that even the, the teacher know about. But why I'm telling this story is um, on the next slide. Um, so grateful. So I've already shared this photo of the launch of Natural Curiosity on the land. Um, but in the left hand corner, you can see that, um, well, you might not know, but um, Marge and Sarah um, actually came to uh, from Fort Francis to support us and be a part of um, launching Natural Curiosity on, on the land. And so it was incredible for them to, to join us in that um, and you know, still have relationship um, with them. And you can see on the next slide when we actually launched the book in um, the at the Institute of, of Child Study. Um, uh, there were educators as well from Rain River District School Board, um, as well as Seven Generations Educational Institute, who who came to support the launch of of the book there. And so, just saying that those relationships and also the their um you know sort of calling us out like jade said like you need to be doing this work you have a huge platform as being associated with the university of toronto um it's time to to support us with with this message of the importance of indigenous perspective in environmental and and all education um and we were lucky enough you can see on the left of this to have nigan sinclair um lead sort of the keynote of the launch of natural curiosity and he so gratefully um it worked with his schedule which was which was pure magic because he's a very busy person if you know him at all um and afterwards he's like well we'll deal with with um um compensation afterwards we'll deal with it and then after the event he said you know what don't worry about it he said I think I have a feeling that this is going to come around come full circle I believe in your work um and um I support this and so if you go two slides uh, ahead just connecting this story um so how this did end up coming full circle is maybe a year or two later, um, we were a part of um, Teach for Canada that sends um, educators to work within communities in um, First Nation communities in Ontario and Northern Ontario. Um, and they do uh, like a week of where everyone comes together in lear for learning in Thunder Bay and Nigan happened to be there as a part of that learning and we had actually um, given um, natural curiosity books to be given away to all of those educators that were um, starting their educational career or, or um, some of them were first year teachers, some of them not, but um, Nigan was joking because he ended up giving them out to those educators. And he's like, I felt like Oprah. He was like, and you get a book, and you get a book, and you get a book. Um, so just a lovely story about, um, you know, relationships and, and, and how those are important and how, um, yeah, they sort of come around and, and we continue to learn together. So I'll pass that back to Jade. Thanks, Haley. That sounds lovely. I think um, the thing that's come to me through this work over the last seven years and, and reading as much as I can is reaching out as much as I can um, to my Indigenous communities around me um, is that Indigenous perspectives are at the heart. Like they are, they are the beating hearts. This is not extraneous, even though I understand that in some, you know, 
for the schooling system, perhaps these things are, are disparate or isolated, but if we can center it, uh, and that's where um, inquiry-based learning, like you say, um, regular visits outside um, really, for me, are just centering that in the work that you do with your students. And our cross-curricular, there can be connections to um, biology, there can be connections to math and counting and the way that the seasons work and days work. And so for me, it, it's, it's a perfect place to, to center this when we do it. If we move on, I think Hayley might speak to this. Oh, we did get to it. So here's the link, the yeah, oh, link that's the, in the chat to his quote. Um, and then the next one is actually a second pod, like a, a second part of the podcast, um, which is actually about appropriation. And I truly recommend that everyone take a listen to this guest speaker on this uh, podcast and she's really talking about that fear that we were talking about um, and so the uh, Peel Indigenous educators asked her about this and she said you know if if settler educators are, you know if we're having this fear you need to pay attention to that fear and start asking questions of that fear she says you know what is it that you're afraid of why are you afraid? And what do you need to do in response to that fear? Um, and so, you know, just really, um, yeah, that, that this encourage you um, as a follow up to this conversation to really think about um, listening to this podcast. Um, there's another great quote that is um, from David Babcock, who's one of the Indigenous educators, who I think is it, that's an important part of this conversation, um, where he said there is a difference between teaching culture and teaching about culture, right? So many people are worried about uh, appropriating. Um, he is a high school educator and he was talking about you know, many Indigenous texts are being brought into um, English programs, which is incredible and should happen. But what he's saying is for the students to actually understand the context of these resources and of these books, they need to learn uh, about culture, but they don't need to actually participate. So one example he gave is, is smudging. You're not going to have a settler educator smudge in their class, but the students need to actually learn about the practice of smudging to understand its importance, especially to the uh, from where we're coming from to the Anishinaabe of this, of this area, to understand the books that they're engaging with and to understand Indigenous perspectives. And so that's sort of um, one of the differences that they talk about and that you can, you can ask yourself, am I teaching culture or am I teaching about culture and about why it's significant and important to Indigenous people and why those perspectives should be um, valued and um, respected um, and humanized. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And one last piece before I pass it back to Jade, um, I know we have about 12, 13 minutes, is um, this quote that I often bring up if you've seen a natural curiosity workshop in the last couple of years, but how um, Sheila Watt, Jay, who she says that it, in, and Jade, you've already said this, but it isn't Indigenous people's sole responsibility to teach everybody about what's happening and to try to get people's attitudes to change. It's everybody's responsibility. We have to stop othering each other and start learning from one another. Um, and so, yeah, what is our responsibility to truth and reconciliation um, and to um, this land and to treaties, if you're from an area that, that has a treaty, um, to UNDRIP. Um, and so, yeah, just, um, I'll pass it back to Jade, but just wanted to share those resources. Thanks, Hayley. Alexa, I'm going to get you to skip the next slide uh, and come back to that, if that's all right, and this one. So these are the things, these are relationships. Um, and so I'd like to thank um, or say Cook's Jam uh, in Shaquetwitzin, um, to Dale Toma um, and to Jenna Jasik. I'd like to say Lim Lim uh, to Leray uh, Wiley, to um, Shelley Boyd, um, 
for the knowledge that has been assimilated here um, to Faye O'Neill um, and uh, Mara Nelson um, and Chief Alfred uh, Joseph for these things. And these are the points that all of those people, um, and I would say, who's a super me, sorry, in Tanaha, they don't have a word for thank you. It means I'm grateful. And more than that, it means I'm grateful from the bottom of my heart. They also don't have a word for please because it was for the Tanaha and, and in my conversations with lots of different indigenous people, it just implied that, of course, um, people are grateful and, 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 and for the things you're giving. If, if, if somebody needs something, you give it. So there's no need to please. There's no need to beg for things. Things are given freely. And that is a sign of, of, of well-being that you have enough to share and that you would always do that. You would be sustainable um, and share and ensure sustainability for the community as a whole. Um, but reading Indigenous stories, um, and this also for me includes listening to Indigenous artists, both um, historical if those exist, First Voices, for example, excellent resource. There are some amazing stories recorded on there that are, you know, recorded, open to share. I, I read books. All of the books we have at the store come from Strong Nations, which is an Indigenous owned and operated publishing house. They're based on Vancouver Island and or we use Natural Curiosity a lot um, and share that, that fantastic resource. But these have been vetted um, by Indigenous uh, publishers themselves. And um, these are stories from, from coast to coast on Turtle Island that share incredibly different perspectives, but reading them, I always start now, I teach about climate change uh, and weather and understanding global systems, even as young as grade three. And the first thing I do is read a Coast Salish book uh, about the sun and the moon, which talks about the fact that they loved each other so much that they got forced apart uh, in order to create space for all of the living beings on Earth. But as the moon was so sad, uh, this is written by Celestine Alec, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing in the, the period of sh shortness of time. Um, but the reason that the moon controls the tides is when the moon had to be forced away from the sun to allow space for the earth and all living beings, it, she broke apart. She was so sad, Grandmother Moon, and bits of her fell into the ocean and, and the bits of the moon dust created plankton, which is the basis for all life. And also the moon, parts of the moon, um, as she cries, that's what she pulls the tides with her and these beautiful i call this a hook i start every lesson any kind of inquiry with a hook a story or a hidden object in a box but these relationships those stories that are theoretically allegory that make so much sense um can be a phenomenal way so i be really believe in reading indigenous stories as long as you say where they come from i have been told several oral indigenous stories or been participated in drumming circles where I'm not to share that. And actually implicitly, if someone tells you a story orally, I would say the standard is do not share unless you've asked for permission or they've told you, oh, this is a story that you can share going forward. But published books are generally in the public domain, ready for you to share. And there are so many that relate to your local place. Learning indigenous names for local things and places. I'm learning both Tanaha and um, in Selsheen tonight and it's hard um but my language teachers Mara Nelson and Chief Alfred Joseph are like we, we need your support there's not enough native speakers we don't have enough indigenous people who have time and energy to learn this so please even if it's just to say good day or um Nukku for bear and the fact that the month of February is Nukku the month because that's when um the bears are starting to think about coming out of hibernation where I live um, first Voices, again, excellent resource. Um, writing a letter or phoning your local indigenous groups, sort of head office, let's have them and saying, hey, um, I'd really like to learn this. Do you have a, a dictionary? Lots of have dictionaries or, or spaces for you to learn that language. Uh, and then sharing that with your class, like embedding that in. We count to 10, um, you know, even the simplest things like that, learning, um, names of local places, the names of your local animals and plants. Always honouring where that information came from. I thanked my, my um, mentors at the beginning of this speech, um, but that really is incredibly important, is, is the honouring of, of that information. And, and honestly, it's, and, and there is no pan-Indigenous um, mindset, none of these things, but every single Indigenous person I have who works in education says, stop being so frightened. 
it's an excuse. It's a barrier to change because if you're too frightened to say things, it's like when we're learning a new language, we, we just whisper, we just keep our mouths shut. If you just open your mouth, they're more likely to understand you. They're more likely to hear you. Try. And if you get it wrong, that's fine. Call them up. Um, have conversations and um, and 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 give it give it a go. Um, I've had students uh, reach out to Dr. Christopher Horsethief, who's a Snaha professor and musician, and ask him if they could choreograph a dance um, to one of his modern musical pieces. And they're very modern, and there's text that goes along with it. And they played it in the background, and they opened up our conference with it. And it was this beautiful moment of of care and student led um, connection and effort. I would ask you to go back to the last slide and I'm hoping possibly we might finish. Um, and if anyone does have any burning questions, think about them or type them in the chat for the last few minutes. But this is Faye O'Neill, an Indigenous educator, um, a Tanaha woman. And I, I wanted to close with her words. And, and there's me speaking, this is part of our podcast, but I'll, I'll explain at the end. I was in Steveston one day with my kids and I think my son must have been, oh, he must have been 11, my oldest child. And we happened to walk into this little store and it was a, it was like a post office cafe thing and we were walking around Steveston and there were some gentlemen and there's some older gentlemen, European descent, and they were talking about Indians getting things for free. And of course, you know, my ears perk up and I'm, I'm there to purchase something that I needed for, for the house. And uh, I'm sitting there going, okay, what is this guy? So finally I turned around and said, you know, that's not true. I'm indigenous and I do not get my fish. They were talking about, because the Steveson's a fishing community, they were talking about all the native people there getting things for their boats for free and all of this for free. And he, the one gentleman turned around and said to me, he said, well, then I guess you don't know your rights if you're not, if you have, I said, I pay taxes. I don't get things for free, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, well, I guess you don't know your rights. And I, and I looked at them and I thought, you know what, this conversation needs to stop because I'm not going to get anywhere with you. Um, yeah. You've already had, you already have a mindset. This is your, the way you're thinking. You know what, I'm not wasting any more breath on you. So I walked away and my son, my oldest son turned around and said, why didn't you, why didn't you correct him? I said, I tried. And there's times where you just need to learn to walk away. And I walked away from the conversation, but it was the first time my son and I ever really questioned why I didn't challenge this person any further. So I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a, a tricky thing. Yeah. Do you, do you fight every fight or do you work in education and educate the next generation to have an, a, better more well-rounded viewpoint and 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 be i just want to see it integrated i, don't, I want it to not to be indigenous and you, you know western i would love to see a curriculum that where it was it well of course if we're talking about ecology we're going to talk about symbiotic relationships and how those animals have been doing it and here's this beautiful story that tells you how that relationship developed and I would love for that that would be pretty cool uh, I think it's I I can see it moving that direction I re, you know it's about bringing those two worlds together right that integration of the two worlds and it's about that understanding um that you know we have that indigenous people had a different mindset of education and of science and the mm. and, teaching their children and I honestly believe that it is getting there but it's not going to be my it's not going to be in my lifetime I, I can I had to finally realize that that it probably is not going to be my lifetime that there is we're going to see changes especially when you look at the way we look at it, it takes seven generations right so my my seventh you know, my great, 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 great grandfather um, was, he was that seventh, gen I'm the seventh generation, or my children are that seventh generation. And we're still, see there is change happening. It's just not going to be in 10 years or so. Through my years of um, working in Aboriginal education, I have seen that we've made maybe five steps forward, but we're taking three steps back. Oh. Um, and, but that's okay. Uh, you know, you have to build a, you have to build a thick backbone for that one. And um, you can't take that heart all the time. And 
and working with youth and all that, you, you know, there's some things that you do take very personal. And when that door slams in your face, you take a step back, you take a breath, and then you try to open the door again. And, it, and I, I do see it's evolving, um, it's changing. That's the end of the recording. So it was Faye Neal speaking. The other voice you heard was Ian Shanahan, who's the editor of Green Teacher and my co-host on the podcast. I just want to say very quickly, there's nothing worse than listening to your own voice recorded back to you. But the second point of that is when she told me that she had experienced racism in front of her children and that was basically discriminated against in her own town, um, rather than just saying, I'm really sorry that you went through that. I launched into this, oh, we're going to fix it with solutions and oh, we should change the curriculum and I care. And and I later apologised to her and we talked about this and she said, oh, I don't tell you personally, but you know, I didn't just sit with her. I didn't just say, I'm really sorry that that's the experience that you have because I've never had that as a white British person. Nobody's ever told me um, that you're getting, you're getting, you, you're getting stuff for free or you and you don't deserve it or anything you know I've never experienced that discrimination so I can't imagine and this woman this woman shares her language with me she shares her stories with me she said information about her family and related to my family and told me that I am important and that the work I do is important after everything she's faced that openness and that connection and so for me that relationship building um write letters have phone calls tell people you care have your kids create um letters or stories and share that it's important and send them and don't expect anything back and if you do get something back wonderful but but reach out um and i just i wanted to close with that because um she's one of the most incredible women and i'm so grateful to have her in my life thank you so much everyone i'm sorry there's not been the um a lot of time. I don't know if anyone has a couple of minutes extra to do questions. And I'll put the link to the podcast now. Yes, thanks everyone um, for joining us today. It's always so hard to sort of fit these really important conversations into an hour, but we're really hoping that this sort of just inspires you to think about, um, yeah, think about your role and and how you continue to do this work in a good way um and yeah how this is so much about um continuing to learn and be humble in in that learning and acknowledge that there is always so much more to learn and that we as educators have the responsibility to do that learning um and that is a part of making sure that we we don't appropriate um, and that we do this work in a, in a good way. Um, so uh, thanks everyone. We can hang out for a little bit longer if anybody has some questions. Um, but as Alexa shared in the chat, we will be writing a follow-up email that will have the recording plus links to any of the resources that we shared and also extra resources that weren't mentioned. Definitely, as well as the contact info for Haley and Jade as well. So if you have any questions, you're thinking about things after this session, you'll definitely be able to reach reach out. And I might pass you off to Alexa because I have a one month old. So yeah, thank you so much, Haley and Jade. It's been a pleasure to learn alongside you both. And thank you everybody for attending this webinar. We hope you enjoyed it.